can get started here. I think there's we're reaching critical mass on the Zoom and everything. Cool. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our lunch speaker for this week, uh, Tara Featherholf, who uh, is a she received her PhD in 2020 working in on galaxies uh, at UC Riverside and is now a UC Chancellor's postdoctoral fellow um, in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department, um, working on some very exciting results in exoplanet demographic characterization, uh, stellar variability, and uh, I think we're going to hear about some of the, these exciting new results today. Uh, so thanks so much. Take it away. Yeah. Yeah. So today I'm going to specifically focus a lot on the stars, but also connect it to the planets. I will advertise the fact again that I do galaxies at the very end. <laughs> But I really want to focus on this this work that I've been doing through my for my postdoc. We're working on producing a test stellar variability catalog, which will be released to the public. In fact, uh, the paper is already available on archive. It is currently in revision. I'm hoping to resubmit uh, within the next month or sooner. Um, so you can go check it out. Um, so, I want to first go into kind of like the, the motivation behind this work. Why are we making this big catalog of variable stars? Uh, talk about the demographics of the variability catalog that we're producing in addition to how we produce that catalog. And then talk about some of the future next steps that we're doing, kind of follow-ups to that work. Uh, and then kind of wrap up towards the end. So if you've ever gone out to the desert or the mountains, you know, get away from the city and you look up at the night sky and you see billions of billions of stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. And you can't help but ask this question, are we alone? And honestly, I like to say, how is it even possible that we're alone? Uh, at the very least, some kind of microbial life, right? Um, and so we've been really trying to understand how this question, is there anybody else out there? And with the discovery of exoplanets, We've even found a broad diversity in the, the types of planets that life could exist on. And it has made us imagine what it might be like to go there. What would it be like to live on a planet with two stars or on a planet that's more massive than Earth and go skydiving? These, these are just ways of getting the, in, the interest of the public. Uh, we will never be able to visit these planets, unfortunately. But it really gives us an idea of what kinds of different planets could be out there that we would have never imagined with just our solar system planets alone. So far, we've discovered about 5,000 exoplanets. And this is really ramped up in basically the last decade uh, with the launch of Kepler and then the launch of TESS. Uh, and you can see that's mostly the green bar with the transit method, which I will talk about in a bit. Uh, and then in addition to radio velocity method, which I'm not going to talk too much about today. But you may say 5,000 planets is a lot. Why do we need one more exoplanet? Why is every exoplanet like an important discovery? It's because we're trying to find answer this question of are we alone? And in, uh, their best bet is to start with something we know that has life, like Earth. And so we want to find the Earth-like planets. So this is putting all of those planets uh, and looking at the energy that they receive at their surface versus the mass of the planet. And Earth goes here, and it's kind of lonely on this plot. So even though we have 5,000 exoplanets, they're all up there. Uh, and the, the kind of life that we understand is down here, and we just need more of them still. So going back again to this question of are we alone? We're really trying to follow the water, trying to say, we know that life on Earth requires water to survive, but this is not as simple as it sounds. You have to consider the effects of the star, the effects of other planets in the system, and then there's the planet itself before you can even get close to, is there water on a planet? Something even remotely close to life as we know it. So I like to call this figure Know thy star, know thy planet, because I'm going to focus on the stars today. Um, so in particular, this section, I'm really going to focus on activity, things like uh, rotation, the intrinsic properties of stars like luminosities and their radii, etc. And then I'll kind of touch upon the planets again at the end. So first of all, I said this is a stellar variability catalog. So what is stellar variability? Well, even our sun is a variable star. It's, it's a quiet variable star, 
but it has uh, regions that are cooler uh, called sunspots. And as the sun rotates, we see those spots come into and out of the line of sight. Those sunspots are also temporal. So they come, they, they uh, sometimes come in and then they sometimes disappear. Uh, so sometimes there's more spots on the sun. Sometimes there's very few spots on the sun. This is a type of variability. This can, the sun and other stars can also have uh, extreme storms from the magnetic fields that are causing these star, star spots. Uh, and that can have an effect on the planets and the planetary atmospheres because these storms can produce X-ray and ultraviolet light. So the effects of stellar variability on Earth can be seen, even though we are quite far away from our sun compared to the almost all of the 5,000 other exoplanets that we know of. Uh, we can see them in terms of the solar storms that cause the aurora borealis. And there have also been storms that have knocked out some Starlink satellites. When we talk about other exoplanets, we're asking how does variability affect an exoplanet's habitability? Because if it has our sun, a quiet star, has that kind of effect on the Earth, which is quite far away, these planets that are around cooler stars that we're discovering much closer in, though that solar storm or star storms could even strip away those atmospheres, and then you're not going to have life at all. I'm also interested in how stellar variability plays into how does the universe work. Every single star goes through a stage of variability at some point in its lifetime. So it plays an important role in the life cycle of galaxies in terms of turning gas into stars and then stars back into gas. Um, and of course, turning uh, as well as the planet formation themselves, because you need to have that higher enrichment of material to produce any planets in the first place. So I mentioned the transit method. So first I wanna talk about what is a light curve. This is the way that we're measuring stellar variability in this case, there are other ways as well. We're measuring the brightness of a star over time. And the stereotypical example that many people have seen is when there is a planet in the star system and the planet crosses in front of the star, causes a dip in the brightness of the star, and then as it moves along on its way, the brightness goes back up. But you don't need a planet to do this. Stars are perfectly capable at being variable in themselves, causing changes in brightness. So each one of these panels is a different star or star system. None of them have planets. So some of these are multi-star systems, such as eclipsing binaries, where the stars uh, kind of transit each other. There's things like uh, stars with spots, like our sun, Stars also pulsate and oscillate. Stars can also gravitationally perturb their shapes. So you're seeing different amounts of surface area as the stars orbit around each other, among very many other types of variability effects. So when I say stellar variability, I'm talking about anything that is periodic, uh, but I'm being very, very broad in terms of the physical mechanism. So to study stellar variability, we're using data from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite called TESS. And specifically for now, we're focusing on data from the PRIME mission, which observed 230,000 stars across nearly the entire sky uh, for every two minutes. So you get a data point of how bright every all those stars are, uh, two minutes, and then two minutes, and then two minutes. And that's uh, nearly continuously for at least 27 days before the spacecraft pans to another region of the sky. There is some overlap, but we're not worrying about that right now. We're just looking at these 27 day segments of data. So this produces uh, a lot of high precision space-based time series photometry. Uh, so once again, I'm gonna say periodic variability. So this means that a changing signal is repeating with time. Uh, because of those 27 day time steps or time, time scales, I'm limiting a periodic search to 13 days or less. And then on the lower end, it's 0 0.01 because of the, the two minute cadence of our observations. And we're aiming to produce a catalog of high purity, which means that we're doing a lot to remove any systematic type nature of uh, that may appear in the data. So for example, when you observe, uh, when you observe from this 
the ground, you may get an alias at one day because you can only observe during the day. And so you turn off, uh, you stop your observations at night, or sorry, I got that backwards. You can only observe at night, turn off during the day, and that can produce a one-day alias and a periodogram. There are different aliases that exist with TESS, though, since it is a space-based uh, observations. So before I jump into kind of how we're producing the catalog, how we're producing high purity, I'm going to, I want to explain these three panels because I'm going to be showing a lot of them. So the left is showing the light curve over this 27-day segment. The black points are the brightness over time for the star. Any gray points here, they, they're, this example is a, there is a planet in the system and I'm just taking out the transit because that is not the stellar effect. So I'm focusing on the effect of the star. The red curve is a sinusoidal fit to the light curve based off of what we've detected in a periodogram. So the repeating signal. Uh, and then the blue triangles are known as momentum dumps in the spacecraft, which are like periodic adjustments of the spacecraft, which could be a source of systematic uh, in a systematic signal or alias. The center panel is the periodogram. In particular, we're using a loam scargill periodogram or for a transform of the light curve. And this tells us what where are the repeating signals that are generally uh, that are generally sinusoidal in shape. I'll talk about a, another method that we use briefly in a bit um, that's not necessarily sinusoidal. But in this case, for this system, we find a significant signal at eight days and at four days. And so the right panel shows that the phase folded light curve, which is essentially taking the most significant sig uh, signal, say eight days, and putting it on top of the next one and on top of the next one. And so you can see that repeating signal in the space bulb. And then same with the four days, and except for this time it's half. And it just repeat, it stacks them right on top of each other. So you can think of this as our sanity check. Does it look like that's a repeating signal when you just put them on right on top of each other? Okay, so now let's talk about what do I mean by a high purity catalog? So one of the methods that we're doing is we're looking at the distribution of all the stars where we perform this periodogram analysis in power versus period space. So this is our period search uh, from one to 13 days. And this is the normalized power from that loam scargle periodogram. If I go back, it's essentially the peak here. So this particular system would be a 0.8. And if we do that for the 230,000 stars, uh, and then we, I've also separated them by sectors, which is a location where the spacecraft is pointing. So like sector one is here, sector two, sector three. So there are 27 day time steps. There could be repeated stars in these places, but what's important is that they're just different areas of the sky. Uh, and the stars in a single sector fall in the same part of the CCD. So we would expect that when you look at stars across the entire sky, it should be uniformly distributed in power period space. The fact that these are not uniformly distributed and they don't even match each other is a red flag. And these are actually indicating spacecraft systematics. So these are aliases, primarily from momentum dumps, but also part of it is related to the orbit. So a single orbit of TESS is about 13 days. So we get something around six to seven days in some cases as an alias. Uh, so I say that we're looking at sy test systematics by density. And basically for each sector, we're saying if there's any high density in this, in this 2D space, we're going to say that's a systematic source and we're going to remove it from our catalog. So we are removing some real variables, uh, but in the concerns of we want a high purity catalog in the end. Yes. Yes, I will get to that in a moment when I show the demographics of the catalog. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, since the, some of this periodicity could be related to the types of stars, such as being on the main sequence, 
Um, so could there be some of that shown in the power period space? Um, and I will get to that in a few slides when I talk about the demographics, but uh, in short, like the answer is like kind of, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily expect it like, they, uh, I'm trying to think, because power is also related a little bit to the brightness of those targets. Um, and I think it would, it would pop out a lot more if um, there was more selection bias. There is certainly selection bias in tests, um, but it's kind of looking at whatever's nearby and bright first before it, before it focuses like just on main sequence. I have an HR diagram, so we are going to look at this. Yeah. Um, Okay, so the overdensity in period makes sense. Yeah. So I'm doing a 2D cut. Um, and then on, I think the next slide, uh, we also make a power cut, like anything. This is kind of like the confidence of our signal. So anything that's low power is just going to be removed in general. Um, but you can think of like, so like this kind of oval region is cut out. Um, this kind of thing is cut out. In fact, Wait a minute, I think the next slide. The next slide shows what these look like when I cut them out. Um, so this is like all of the sectors. Um, and so you can see like a lot of them. Did I repeat the question? No. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, the question was related to how do we cut in power space? How do you interpret that? How do you, yeah, how do you interpret the over density just in power space? And the answer is I'm doing it in 2D space. Um, yeah, but a lot a lot of it does pool up at the bottom, and that's because not everything is significantly variable. So they're going to be just low signal. In fact, here I've already cut out anything less than point uh, point zero zero one. Um, but a lot of this is here. It's because this is a point of a systematic spacecraft alias, and there's one between two to three days as well. Okay. Uh, and I believe that is what I was going to say on that slide. So I can just go on to the next slide. <laughs> um, okay, so other ways that we are removing kind of false positive variability or systematic source variability uh, is also looking at linear trends. You may say this is not systematics. This is actually a real variable star. You can see the trend visually, but the very the signal is greater than 13 days. And that is the limit of my periodogram search. So for now, those are removed from the catalog. Um, we will be doing a longer period search later. Uh, similarly, if the periodogram maxes out at 13 days, that means uh, there is a, uh, some kind of periodic signature that's very close to 13, maybe 14. But I'm going to have to remove those as well because I'm limiting myself to 13. And then this is the low power cut that I just mentioned. Um, so in this case, this one just falls right under 0 0.001. And you can also see the loam scargo periodogram is pretty messy. This one peak does not really stand out from the rest of the peaks in the periodogram. Okay. So now I want to go through some examples of things that do make it into the catalog. Um, so they're going to be categorized into these different names. Uh, you already saw this, this word one sign once, which means that uh, it's mostly finding a single sinusoidal shape in the periodicity. Um, so this means that if we look at the middle column, these are loam scargle periodograms, and there's going to be one peak that is significant. Um, so uh, I believe the center one is an M a rotation of an M star. The top one is a rotation of an F star. And the bottom one is an example of a giant star, which is uh, has less like the the if we look at the phase folded light curve, it's a little messier, and that's because it's mostly caused by the spots that are coming and going very quickly for the giant stars or changing. Okay, then we have two sign, which is means that there were actually two significant periodicities in the Lone Scargle periodogram. Uh, this is generally going to be caused by uh, beat periods, pulsations, or otherwise ge general irregularity. Uh, so I believe the top one is a delta scuti. This middle one is another rotating F star. And the bottom one is another giant star. 
And then I, uh, in addition to loam scargill periodogram, because loam scargill is for sinusoidal periodic variations, we also use a autocorrelation function, which doesn't care about shape, uh, but it just cares about strictly periodic signals. And so this is going to really do a good job on the eclipsing binary. So if we look at the phase curve, you can see the eclipses as the stars are crossing in front of each other. Uh, so we have two eclipsing binaries here with very different shapes out of, out of eclipse. And then up at the top is an RR Lyrae variable star. Okay, so here's my HR diagram of all of the stars that make it into the variability catalog. So this is 50,000 stars out of our 230 that we started with. And um, so we have the intrinsic brightness, luminosity of the stars versus their effective temperature. And then I've colored the stars by the measured variability period that comes out of the lone scargill periodogram. And so as you can see, as you had mentioned, it does matter where they are in the main sequence. <laughs> yes, uh, does matter where they are in the main sequence. So in addition to where a star is on the HR diagram telling us what type of stage in the evolution these stars are at, say on main sequence or in the giant branch, it also is saying that the variability is related to the stage of evolution of the stars, which is where I had said every star is variable at some point in its lifetime. So now let me go through and show some more examples of light curves at different regions of the HR diagram. Uh, so first we have F, G, and K stars. So the sun is like about here. And these are generally going to be rotational variables. So they're going to have star spots that are rotating into and out of the line of sight. They generally have longer variability periods that are around tens of days. So there's even a lot missing here because they're going, like our sun, for example, has a rotation period of 30 days and we're limiting to 13. But uh, F, G, K stars tend to slow down as they age in terms of their rotation. So that means that the variability period will go up as they age. Meanwhile, on the low mass end, we have the M stars. They tend to rotate much faster. Uh, so they have variability periods like kind of like just under one day. And this is because they have fully convective interiors. So they do not lose angular momentum as they age. So they're a lot harder to age date. And then on the higher mass end, we have uh, oscillating or pulsating stars, uh, such as the Delta Scooties. But perhaps what, oh yes. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, it, what does variability period refer to the most significant period in the analysis? Uh, and the answer is yes. It's so for one sign, it's just the only one. For two sign, I am selecting the the single period, uh, the the most significant one. Um, it doesn't change much. the The one sign category has the most of the stars. Um, the two sign has maybe six thousand out of the fifty thousand, and then I think the ACF has less than a thousand or something. Um, okay, so this is, yeah, the most, we're, we're keeping it simple. This is the most significant uh, in the photometry because measuring very like stellar variability, you can also measure from spectroscopy, but this is specifically from the time series photometry. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to, instead of looking at the HR diagram, I'm going to flip the color bar axis with the x-axis. And instead, we're going to look at the period luminosity diagram. And so here, in my opinion, you can see a lot more substructure. Uh, and there's a lot going on. And all of it is astrophysical in nature, which is very cool, in my opinion. Um, so you, I mentioned the high mass oscillators. I men, ma mentioned the eclipsing binaries, M stars. These are like the F stars and rotational variables. And we've got giants all up there. So let's kind of dive into these and look at the light curves. So first up, we have the M dwarfs, which looks very similar to the one I showed earlier. It's another very fast uh, rotator. Um, you can even see some, some 
uh, there's higher points here. Those are not accidental outliers. Those are actually flares coming off the M star. M star. Um, and then we have stars that are on both sides of the craft break, uh, in particular, this is like the F stars. Uh, so the craft break is where there is a change in the way angular momentum is uh, taken away from the system. So on this side of the craft break, uh, more angular momentum is taken away through stellar winds. So those stars are tend to slow down as they age. And then we have over contact binaries. This is a special type of binary system where not only are they some usually eclipsing, but they're so close to each other that they're like physically warped and sometimes touching. And so you're seeing like this, this infinity type shape in different perspectives as those stars orbit each other. And then we have high mass oscillators, which a lot of these are delta scooties. Um, and so this is where uh, if I were to select, uh, say, one variability period over another, if there's more than one, sometimes it's not the best choice. And so that's why if I, if I believe if I just go back, it kind of looks like there's like two kind of segments. So that's from just selecting one over the other. And same with the binaries, there's two. This is half. It should be here. OK, and then the last one here is showing an example from the evolved giant branch. Um, and this one is another example where it's kind of a little bit of spots and pulsations, and the spots are evolving so quickly that it looks a little messy in the phase folded like her. OK, so there is a lot of stellar astrophysics that can be done with this. And I am encouraging people to go just go dive into the data and have fun. Uh, and the way that you can do this at home or right now or later today is if you go to filtergraph.com slash test variability. This is a publicly available link, which I will show you now. I'm going to demo it if my internet allows or your internet allows me to. <laughs> um, so if you come to filtergraph.com slash test variability, it will start you off with an HR diagram. And if you click on a random point, I went on the subgiant branch, uh, it will show you the specific identifier for that point, all of the tabulated information for that point. And then if you click on this little box, it will hopefully bring up a figure like those three panels that I showed you. So this, this uh, data set is really fun to just click around and look at light curves and see what you can find. So this is how, when we looked at period luminosity space, uh, which is down here, we were able to say these are real astrophysical effects because we would just click on something, say here, which should be an overcontact binary. It's a faint one. Um, and let's go here, probably a double scooty. Yeah. So I encourage you to have fun with this. Um, there's a couple of other figures down there as well that mimic figures that are in the paper. And then um, let's get rid of that. There we go. And then pretty soon, you will also be able to access the uh, full data set in terms of the tables, you, instead of just clicking on an object and getting that one object. But if you just want the whole catalog, it will be available as a high-level science product on MAST in the near future. We have a DOI reserved until the paper is published. Um, or in the meantime, you can just email me, and I will send you the data. Um, these, this uh, high-level science product will also include those figures for every single object in the table. I, that is more difficult to send people. I can send you like a subset, but that file is very big. Um, technically, I can send it, <laughs> but it is big, so like, which is why we want it to be available there. Okay, so now I talked about planets in the beginning but then I talked about stars. So now we're gonna go back to this question of how does variability affect habitability and talk about the planets. Uh, so again, I just showed you all sorts of examples of how stars are changing over time quite rapidly. And our very basic understanding of the habitable zone is just based off of the effective temperature of the star at one single point in time. Uh, but we know that stars change in effective temperature over their lifetimes. And if they're variable, 
there's even small fluctuations in their temperature or their energy outputs in other types of ultraviolet X-ray radiation, for example, even optical near infrared, which is in tests, that could have effect on their exoplanets. So now we're going to look at this know thy star, know thy planet. Before we were talking about the star, now I'm going to spend a minute talking about how this connects back to the planet, specifically some of the planet properties, and then how does that connect to planetary atmospheres. So when we're studying exoplanet atmospheres, we're not actually looking at the exoplanet. We're looking at the star. And so you need to know the star very, very well to study an exoplanet atmosphere. When we do transmission spectroscopy, where the planet goes in front and we look at the star and the planet at the same time, uh, we're measuring how the starlight transmits through the atmosphere's bounces or is stopped by clouds. And then if we look at the planet, Terry, the, or the, the star planet combination, we may also see a reflected light signature, which is telling us how the starlight is being reflected off the upper atmosphere or the surface if there's no atmosphere. All of this requires you knowing the star. So if the star is going all over the place, this is very, very hard to do. The other thing is you have to ask yourself what you're seeing. Is it really a planet? There have already been so many cases where a signal that looks like a planet transit is actually two stars in one of these orientations. But stellar variability does the same thing, uh, especially if you are looking at radio velocities, for example. So uh, I've been working with Emily Simpson, who is now at SETI Institute, to look at the effect of stellar variability on planetary atmospheres. So she's taken the subset of stars that are in the variability catalog, 50,000. Those are in the gray points in this figure and looked at those that have known exoplanets. So these are confirmed, not candidate. Uh, so this means that they have an associated mass measurement. Uh, and so those confirmed planets are marked by the colored points in this figure, by their detection method. Uh, yellow is radio velocity, blue is transit, and red is imaging. Um, and so she's taking the sample and looking at how their atmospheric properties or general demographics may depend on the variability that we measured from the light curves. But also she's done this investigation of looking at the measured variability period from the light curves versus the known orbital period measured from these planets. There's a couple of suspicious cases that land on this one-to-one -one line. Turns out we visually followed up all, like all of these and looked at them in depth. One of them was a false positive. So one of them was a sub-Earth planet uh, with uh, radial, just detected through the radial velocity method. And uh, then we saw this white bit whopping stellar variability or variability signal in the light curve, which could be caused by phase curve, phase variations, um, such as the reflection signature. But for a small planet, they would not be of that extreme amplitude. So we were able to say this is a very likely false positive, and that planet is now marked as controversial on the NASA X Planet Archive. And you can see more of that work in Emily's paper from 2022. Uh, she just submitted her 2023 paper, which is more on this uh, overview of known exoplanets around variable stars. The big thing she's finding is that this is hard to do right now because uh, exoplanets around variable stars are not really the easiest thing to look at as I've been explaining. Uh, so there's a lot of observational bias here. People just tend to avoid, oh, that thing's variable, like let's not bother. Um, so that's why there's very few planets in here. Um, there's even a gap here, which is also an observational bias from tests. And just forget it with the higher mass stars that are oscillating all over the place. So the next step for this work, uh, so as I said, the, uh, the current test stellar variability catalog is nearly complete. Uh, it is on the archive. It is going to be resubmitted very soon. There is a DOI for the tables and the, uh, the, the figures that it will be a high level science product on mass very soon. soon. So the follow-ups are to extend it beyond 13 days because for now I've only looked at one 27 day segment at a time during the first two years of tests and proposals are due for cycle six uh, in a month or two. 
So there's a lot more work to be done with this work. This is very difficult because when you stitch that data together, those stars have moved to a different point on the CCD. And so now you're introducing systematics between the two data set and you have to know how to stitch them together without just detecting a 30 day signal over and over and over again. Um, so we have some methods for working this out. Uh, and so this is kind of like the next project that we're working on. And then the next step is actually digging into the full frame images, which are shown here. So I've been talking about the two minute time step. Uh, so those are targeted uh, systems where there's like a image take or the brightness is measured every two minutes, but the full frame images in the beginning were every 30 minutes and they're getting even better. They're down to, I think, 100 or 200 seconds in uh, the upcoming cycles. So we can make those light curves for even more stars. So an example of this sector stitching that I just mentioned that we tried, uh, we used the test sip algorithm. Uh, I think it's Systematics Insensitive Periodogram. It's on GitHub. Um, by written by largely by Christina Hedges. And uh, we took this, this system, which is a known exoplanet system in this case, and shown on the left is the light curve. The gray is the exoplanet transits that have all been cut out. And then this is our periodogram that now goes from about eight to 24 days. And we get a period at about 17 and a half days, which agrees with the measured V sine I or rotation period from the spectroscopic measurements. So this is a great confirmation of this method. So to kind of wrap things up, uh, we produced a catalog known as the test stellar variability catalog of 50,000 stars that are deemed as significantly variable on time scales of 0.01 to 13 days. Uh, as I showed by, through the period luminosity diagram, this catalog probes many different realms of stellar astrophysics. And I encourage you to go play with the data through uh, filtergraph.com slash test variability, or you can scan this QR code, which goes to my website that gives you access to the paper and uh, a link to the filter graph portal. And then in our next couple steps, we'll be uh, investigating longer term variability and also how variability affects exoplanet atmospheres. And then there's one more thing. Uh, so I know that there are a lot of uh, cosmologists here and uh, extra galactic people. And so I've been, I actually have two driving questions to my research overall. And we've talked about the test stellar variability catalog and how do stars affect their planets. But the other side of me is on the other side of the sky scale, which is in the structural evolution of galaxies. Uh, my PhD work was on studying how a galaxy structure influences evolution, specifically at Redshift 2, using like moss, stuff and candles. So if you're interested in talking more about that later in the day, put yourself on the schedule if you're not already. And I'm happy to talk about that work as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Great talk. So we can take questions on Zoom or in the room. And uh, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand and or just unmute. <laughs> we should be able to hear you. I can start with one. So in that test full frame image uh, you had, it looked like there were some semi, <laughs> probably not resolved, but uh, largest galaxies. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> which, which are those? You may have heard of them. <laughs> This is the small Magellanic cloud <laughs> and the large Magellanic cloud. <laughs> I assume so. I mean, they, you've got the nice bar in the in the LMC. I mean, yeah. they just look so tiny in this. Well, I mean, this is <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It's each one of these is like this segment of the yeah. sky. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm like I assume people are doing stuff with with uh, light curves of some of the brighter uh, Magellanic cloud targets. Yeah, there's stuff. definitely people who are working with the test data, doing uh, extragalactic work, doing AGN work, doing supernova work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is quite diverse. It's just like that segment is much smaller of a community. Totally. Um, but this this data is like free, on mass, available immediately. There's no proprietary period. It's already processed for you. So like anybody can just dive into the data. Yeah, yeah. And that's like before any of the stellar variability catalog work, like the light curves are just out there. Maybe just to follow up on this, 
Okay. Okay. The data is free, uh, kind of, and reduced. So, like, how much like knowledge of, say, I don't know, photometry or whatever you you need to have to actually, you know, be able to get something meaningful out of this. Yeah. Um. So the quite oh, you had the mic. So okay. Uh, so it depends on what kind of thing you want to do. So the, for the, the light curves, um, there are a couple of tools in Python and there's like great guides, like particular there's, um, it's called light curve with a K L I, you know, the word light. And then instead of curve with a C, you spell it with a K. Um, that tool has a lot of helpful guides. Um, but that's for looking at time series photometry. If you're interested in just kind of like what's going on on the pixel to pixel level, then you would go into the target pixel files, maybe look at the brightnesses. You could look at individual targets in the uh, test input catalog. And that has all that tabulated information that I showed on that website. Most of that's not mine. Most of it comes from that input catalog. And that includes like uh, temperatures of stars, the different colors, uh, classifications, uh, if it's including whether it's not a star and things like that. Um, so there, there are a lot of resources. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and so my actual question is on the on the input. So you said that your variability catalog has fifty thousand stars, but Tess has like you removed an, many of them, right? It has yeah. millions, right? Uh, so, so so just from the the two first two years, right. and looking at the two minute targets. Right. Um, so those were hand selected. That's two hundred thirty thousand. Uh, so that was the base my base sample. Um, but but now Tess has looked at much more than that, including the targets. And then that's where I say the full frame right. images are like, yeah, millions. Right. And so I guess, yeah. My, so my question is like going even for, for those 230 uh, to 50,000, mm -hmm. um, like, is it possible to still recover some of those variability measurements uh, from the systematics? So, so not just to kind of remove them from sample, but actually tr try to model systematics and variability at the same time? Yes. So that's kind of what the uh, test uh, systematics and sensitive periodogram is, is trying to do. Uh, it is computationally expensive which is why I don't do it on the entire data set and why I'm still deciding how I want to move forward with even just doing this with sector stitching. Um, and this is also like what the, the, I said that there's a pipeline already for reducing the data. The pipelines try and remove the systematics, but sometimes they remove astrophysics. And that's where the real challenge comes across is, is do you, are you removing just systematics or are you removing? astrophysics and it depends on what you care about and the pipelines care about planet transits <laughs> <laughs> so it can it can be difficult difficult there's a lot of people who are developing their own pipelines as well to depending on their science mm -hmm. um but yes people are working on it it's just hard okay and i guess really quick follow-up out of the 50 like do you have are all known exoplanet hosts in your variability catalog no no okay so they're still like you know, so they're interesting yeah. targets that you would want to add yeah so the... there are so this was a subset of star of planets that are around variable stars not all stars are variable um there are quite even our sun is is quiet technically i mean i i said it's not but uh so the um that's where most of the planets are so there's five thousand planets and i only there's only about 300 three to four hundred in the um in emily's work seller uh, of the known host around variable stars um and it's because people are prioritizing the quiet stars thanks i had a question about this slide actually so yeah, yeah it makes sense why you started with the 27 day like single kind of shots um if you want to go to longer periods, it seems tempting to just go straight for like the continuous viewing zone. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you? Is it just because the sector switching between test moving is just that bad? Yeah. Um, let me, because this one, no, that's a different slide. I guess it was. No, it just showed it. I guess it was this one. That one right before it. Here we go. Here's another version of this. 
um, yeah, so so the things that I've tried this on are the things where the sectors are continuous. Um, and it is related to the sector stitching because if you get this like slightly wrong, this offset, um, you'll get this repeating. You, your periodogram, which already looks like not great, is just going to find the 30 day signal. Um, but so this is just showing another example uh, that seems to do okay. And even then you look at this and it looks really messy. Um, but uh, this is kind of like a step, but a lot of people agree this is hard to do. Uh, it's, it was hard to do in Kepler, which was even higher precision spacecraft because it was just staring at one space, one spot for four years, and then things didn't move from different parts of the CCD. So like there's a lot of complications when you're putting a star in a different part of the CCD, okay. even when you're just scanning. Um, but the easiest ones to like test this, this method out are the continuous viewing zone. Um, and so that's where we're going to be starting first because we really do got to take this kind of one target at a time for now until um, we kind of feel like we more confident about um, this algorithm. All right, thank you. And I have one more quick one, if that's yeah. okay. Um, just a quick question about how you did the periodogram. So you, you do the sign fit first, um, then how do you know if it's not sinusoidal and you have to go to an ACF? So we actually do the periodogram, loam scargle periodogram search first. Uh, which then, um, let's see if I can, let's just go way back, back here. I have like one, I don't know if this is actually going to show off. This is from like one of my earlier papers that's talking more about the Lone Scargo paragraph. That one's not relevant. It's fine. Um, so first we do this, which uh, we just scan through our one to 13 days in some fine step. Um, and then from here, we then do the sinusoidal fit um, with the period fixed, or it's not fixed, it started with the prior. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then that fits for the amplitude and the offset and stuff like that. Um, and then, so we do, the first step is we do the single sinusoidal. And then we do the, the we say, okay, where's the second peak? And is the second peak significant enough and different enough? Uh, like in terms of amplitude to be to be included or to be considered as a two peak. Um, so if I go back to these, um, they're very distinct. Um, and so there's some language for for um, automatically detecting the one, the two peaks, and then two, what like is this significant enough to use the higher complexity in the mo model? So like some chi squared uh, minimization thing. And then we also do the ACF. Um, and then we say, what's the significance of the ACF? So this is no longer a loam scargle period autogram. This is the correlation of the autocorrelation. Uh, and this has to actually be pretty high. It has to be above 0.8 to, for this to work um, or to be allowed as the default fit. So we, we do all three of them, uh, one, two, and three on every single target. And then we just iteratively jump up depending on the um, the power or the correlation and then the goodness of fit. Thank you. But the default is if it's not two peak or ACF, it goes to one peak and then we filter things out. Any more questions? I had uh, another, so the it seems like, yeah, there's like a ton of interesting stellar astrophysics to to dig out of mm -hmm. uh, this HR diagram with all these these beautiful light curves. One thing that comes to mind is uh, like the rotation distribution of these stars, which I guess especially for the M dwarfs is like maybe close to like initial <laughs> rotation distribution. Um, how do you know how like the have you looked at like what the that you know rotation period distribution looks like in comparison to other uh, other surveys, other probes and like is, does this provide sort of like a another like orthogonal sort of way to, okay. to get this stuff. So your question has two things to it. So there's one comparing with surveys and the other ones, you're, it sounds like you're talking about uh, gyro chronology a little bit, which is matching uh, the rotation periods with ages. That's right. where the, the big money is going with this is like nailing down stellar ages through their rotations. And even, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I think I was, I was kind of going towards like a, like what is the initial rotation distribution uh, for these stars, but, but yeah. right, right. Yeah. This, yeah. Which is related to their ages. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
I have not delved into the stellar astrophysics that much, besides knowing this utility for uh, gyro chronology. Um, and there have been lots of other people who are going into that in particular. I know Ruth Angus uh, has been leading that forefront. Um, but but uh, she's looking at like stellar cl clusters. So, you you know, everything's the same age. And then you look at the rotation distribution. I have not done that yet. Um, but that's where I'm like, there's many avenues to explore, like so many um, to where people should be working on this. And there's the data. Go go get it. Go have fun. Because I'm going to go look at, at how it, my particular next steps is looking at how that connects to exoplanet properties. Um, so I'm not saying like, don't scoop me. I'm saying go go do it. Um, and then the second part, which I do have a figure for, you were saying about surveys. Uh, this one is not the, the most up-to-date version of this. Uh, I've been actively working on this, but, but basically grabbing the stars that are also in other catalogs of variable stars. Um, so we have uh, Assassin, the TESS Eclipsing Binary Catalogs, Wiki Transient F Factory, uh, Ogle, and this is SuperWASP Vespa. Um, so some of these are ground-based and then TESS EVs is from TESS. Um, and just looking, so there's a, there's a lot of overlap with our catalog, but also many of these do go to longer periods. Uh, so some of the, like the TESS EVs go longer because the EVs are, eclipsing binaries are just so periodic that they're much easier to stitch together. Um, and then uh, Assassin, ZTF and Ogle and Vespa, I think are all ground-based. And so they've been observing for forever, which is why we have things in the thousand day periods. And just to show off an example, uh, this is for the Assassin catalog and their periods match our periods very, very well. So this is our, our sand V check. And we've been doing this with all the catalogs that uh, those catalogs that I listed and they all kind of look like this, where this is the one-to-one -one, and then this is like a half so um, in this case, I'm getting half of this sinusoidal signal and it should be doubled. It's very common for the eclipsing binaries. Cool. Any more questions? I don't see any hands raised in the Zoom. But feel free to unmute as well. But if not, uh, let's thank Tara again and uh, thanks so much for this great talk. Yeah.